now on for as a little time to remember the age when the sun always seemed to shine, but clouds were gathering on the horizon. Things and faces, friends and places, years and moments half forgotten, laughs, fears, songs, tears, memories are made of this. I remember a time in Britain which only stamp collectors can look back upon with real appreciation. You see, for some months they'd been printing a special issue of stamps on which the head was the same as it had been for years, but the layout was new. Commemoration stamps for a silver jubilee. The celebration of the 25 years reign of a king who had seen his people through the greatest war in history and the discouraging peace that followed. King George V and Queen Mary's Jubilee. A flag time, a bunting time that, alas, was to prove but the beginning of a much sadder story. Yes, Britain in 1936 was a land that had known a quarter of a century under the same king, in a world changing bewilderingly fast. Eighteen years of a peace, never really quite peaceful, one never really cloudless. And then... This is London. The following bulletin was issued at 9.25. The king's life is moving peacefully towards its close. Almighty God, to call to his mercy our late sovereign lord, King George the Fifth, of blessed and glorious memory, that the high and mighty Prince Edward Albert Christian George Andrew Patrick David is now become our only lawful king by the looks of God of Great Britain, Ireland, and the British dominions beyond the sea, defender of the faith, emperor of India. So, after only a few months of printing, the dyes were changed, and a new head appeared on the letters. And the spring and summer saw Edward VIII of England making his royal calls up and down the country, the figure of a monarch as yet uncrowned. Long live the king. In 1936, the streets couldn't be said to look very different from the way they do now. Oh, I don't know. Perhaps there were a few subtle differences. The general atmosphere, the buses, the clothes, the hats, the outlines and appearance of the cars. Steam traction engines still hauling coal or beer. And then, of course, the trams. Many cities still have them, I know. But for London, they're now just a memory. A shilling all day, with all the bone shaking thrown in. Trams. And yet, TV. In 1936, the British Broadcasting Corporation opened the first television service in the world. A new medium for faces as well as voices. Next talk shop. Tommy Maybe Handley and Ronald Franca discussed the situation. Let's talk about affairs of the world. Ah, the affairs of the world. Now, take the humming top. What's that got to do with it? Well, it's a world affair. <laughs> Everything depends upon supply and demand. Yeah. 
Do you know what happens, for instance, when there's a failure in the sugar crop? Yes. What? A lump comes in my throat. <laughs> Can you beat that? Do you know, actually, Mr. Winterbottom, there's enough corn raised to cover every toe in England. And that'll spoil the pilgrim's progress. Well, that's Bunyan. Yes, it now, is. what I meant was, there's enough food for every man, woman, and child. But is the food for thought? With this elimination of the horse traffic? Fuck. Leather sellers can't get a meal for a tanner. And blacksmiths are working on the farms, shoeing this. It's propaganda that's wanted. On the subject of horses, there were the usual crowds at Epsom that year, on Derby Day, which is the day to see everybody who loves a flutter. If not there in fact, they were there in spirit. Well, look at the list of jockeys. Big names then, if not today. That day, a horse broke the record for that grueling and highly contested classic. A record that at the time of my telling you, at any rate, still stands. A horse called Mahmud. His owner, the Aga Khan, went to lead in his champion with a beaming smile. So he was rich, we know. But even money can't always produce a derby conqueror. Now, what else was in the news? In another part of England, a Mrs. Miles drew the king's bounty of four pounds for producing quads. Another baby aged one year, Edward Nicholas George Paul Patrick, with his parents, the Duke and Duchess of Kent. In the Netherlands, Princess Juliana announced her engagement to Prince Bernhardt of Germany, a naturalized Dutch subject, a marriage that was to last in spite of preliminary opposition. Berlin, an open Mercedes rolled through the streets towards the stadium specially built for the Olympic Games, bearing to the scene Germany's VIP of all VIPs. Then the torch arrived from Greece, and in the presence of Adolf Hitler, the flame was lit. The games were on. Flags flying together, the nation's athletes marching shoulder to shoulder, regardless of color or creed, binding the ties in a common bond of sportsmanship. Yes, it was all very hail fellow well met. But when the doves of peace flew upwards over the Fuhrer's head, it was into a sky not as cloudless as it might have been for such an occasion. For in the nearby demilitarized Rhineland, the tramp of soldiers' boots across the bridges had demonstrated to the world that Germany's VIP had an unusually vigorous mind. Afterwards, they found out that Hitler's troops had orders to withdraw at the first sign of opposition. Afterwards. So what, some said. After all, the Rhineland is Germany. But it wasn't exactly something to cheer about, not exactly another jubilee. Meanwhile, far away in Africa, the tramp of soldiers' feet again, oft times bare. For a year, the drums had beat in Ethiopia, calling the tribesmen to the defense of their country. The battle was now nearly over, but though the end was near, morale was still high. March and train, march and countermarch, with spears, bows and arrows, antiquated rifles, muskets and shotguns, these pathetic weapons against a conqueror who had taken the sword to become, as he had claimed, Islam's protector. But Il Duce's protection meant for Ethiopia the onslaught of tanks, guns and bombing planes, and against such force, spears and courage were not enough. With the fall of his capital, Addis Ababa, Haile Selassie, the Lion of Judah, sought sanctuary in Britain. The world might deem Ethiopia none of its business, yet, like it or not, the presence of that dignified figure on English soil was a reminder to the world of its conscience. In Egypt, a king had died after teeth extraction. His 16-year-old son hurried back from Britain to take the throne. Farouk. 
In London, his ministers sought closer ties with Britain through the British Foreign Secretary. The little black clouds of Ethiopia and sanctions were to be good training for Anthony Eden for greater crises to come. And talking of little black clouds, the new German ambassador arrived in London, Herr von Ribbentrop. That day it rained. Over the Bay of Naples in Italy, Vesuvius added her quota to international gaiety by staging an eruption. Quite a show. Knowing the Italian sense of humor, no doubt these outpourings of molten lava and hot air must have evoked many a satirical comparison with certain bombastic statesmen of the time. On the subject of hot air, somebody in 1936 brought out a new kind of gasless balloon. First you pumped air into the bag, then you got all the lift you wanted to raise you into the sky by heating up the aforementioned air with a burner. Highly ingenious, but when you think of it, surely highly inflammable as well. Progressive, but short-lived, but no doubt highly entertaining. And talking of entertainment, what movies were you looking at in 1936? The studios were busy in Hollywood and Elstree. Maybe it was Mimi with Douglas Fairbanks Jr. and Gertrude Lawrence. I've never seen Paris from so high up before. And I've never seen it looking more lovely. I was always told it was a long way up to heaven was worth the climb. That face is Jack Buchanan. That is Googie Withers. And remember Edward Everett Horton? Good morning, sir. Good morning, madam. And it is a good morning, with the birds singing in the air, heavy with the fragrance of a hundred species of rampant flora. Oh, it's good to be alive, sir. Vibrant, tingling, full of animal spirits. Shut up! Buchanan against Jack LaRue. On the other hand, you might have seen Stanley Lupino and Laddie Cliff trying to cope with American heavyweight champion Max Baer. Cliff, if you'll stand up and fight me like a man, I'll give him the first three punches. Did you hear what the gentleman said? Yes, uh, yes. You've got the first three punches. Oh, I'm not worrying about the first three punches. It's the fall. Conference. Yes. <clears throat> where shall I hit him? In the dining room. In the where? In the dining room or the pantry. Well, couldn't I go around the back and put my foot through his scullery window? <sighs> Excuse me. Thank you. Oh, my hand. 1936. I remember the Queen Mary making her maiden voyage. The depression had held up the Mary's construction, but the sorrows of her birth didn't make her final lines any less beautiful. Later, she won back the blue ribbon from the French liner, Normandy. Yes, a beautiful ship. Among the transatlantic travelers that year was a lady bearing a famous name, Sarah Churchill. Then there was a Mr. Vic Oliver. Is it true that you're going to marry Miss Churchill? There is a statement that I cannot answer at the present time because, as I said before, I must wait till her brother, Randolph, arrives here tomorrow morning. And behind that great skyline? New concrete, steel, and great spanning bridges. An America demonstrating new strength in tremendous public works and giant undertakings. In the name of the people of the United States, to whom you, bold and am, are a symbol of greater things in the future, and in the honored presence of guests from many nations, I call you to life. touch of a switch, waters, hitherto controlled only by nature, gushed forth to make a spectacle, as Franklin D. Roosevelt had put it, 
symbolic of a nation pulling itself together after the dark days of uncertainty and depression. The New Deal found a dam being opened, it seems, nearly every other week. And where there were dams, there was power. And where there was power, there was recovery. I recall well the docking of another ship on the Atlantic seaboard that year, because on her deck was a man whose opinions were always forthright. If you might be uncertain as to whether that was the most famous beard in history, the one man to convince you was GBS. Of George Bernard Shaw, the American reporter asked a very interesting question. About King Edward, sir, uh, now do you feel, do you think that he'll uh, take away now that he's uh, sent up the throne? Now, how on the face of the earth do I know? He's got on to middle life without being married. Why shouldn't he go on the rest of it without being married? There are heirs to the throne all around him. He can't get married now without cutting out his niece. He's very popular. And you think for that reason it might uh, hold him back from getting married? Well, I don't speculate about it at all. It's impertinent. He doesn't speculate about whether I'm... Well, I forgot I'm married, of course, already, so he couldn't uh, have anything to say about that. A month or so later, an American newsreel had more to say on the same subject. King Edward VIII, the world's most famous bachelor, has often been a best man, but never a bridegroom. At the wedding of the Duke of Kent, King Edward seemed pleased to see his youngest brother march to the altar, but his own wedding march has yet to be written. Today, the American press is filled with rumors of royal romance, of the possibility of King Edward marrying Mrs. Wallace Simpson, the former Baltimore Belle. Yesterday, as a girl, she lived in Maryland, in this quiet and humble Baltimore home. Tomorrow, she may dwell in Buckingham Palace. King Edward and Mrs. Simpson have been pictured together on many occasions. And in this topsy-turvy world, it may be time for an American woman to marry a British king. Only one man knows the answer, and as yet, he is keeping it a royal secret. But such voices were as yet unheard in Britain. A Britain looking forward to the pomp and ceremony of a coronation. Planting coronation trees, making coronation mugs, stamps, and generally expressing its enthusiasm for the popular central figure of that coming coronation. No summer could ever be subdued by a mere handful of clouds. What did you do that summer? If you were in Britain, maybe you went to Henley. Or oh, you didn't. Maybe you went to the bowling greens or the cricket fields. Or took to the road, cycling, motoring or hiking. Or you didn't. Maybe you took a trip across to Ireland to watch a crack motor race and collect autographs from such enthusiasts as Prince Bira. Or perhaps you found the noise of exhausts too much for you. Maybe cows, where you could see the towering canvas of the Endeavour, one of the giant contenders for the America Cup. Then there was another pleasure yacht, the Narlin. Quietly, she slipped her moorings and quitted Britain for the sunnier climes of the Mediterranean, soon to be joined by a king and his guests. Among them, a Mrs. Wallace Simpson. July, August, and the Olympics ran their courses. There were some spectacular efforts put forward in the name of international sportsmanship. Those are the long legs of New Zealand's Lovelock, winning one of the few victories that fell to the British Commonwealth that year, the 1,500 meters. But though the nations in the name of peace publicly paid tribute to champions, elsewhere they privately championed causes. Over France's southern frontier came sounds of strife and streams of refugees. For Spain was a land divided against itself. 
the Spanish rightists rose against the newly elected government. There was an explosion of passion in a country sharply contrasted between poverty and wealth, left and right. At first, the government maintained control. Then, from Spanish Morocco, the governor of the Canaries, a General Franco, brought to the rebels reinforcement and leadership. And then Spain was in for agony. In that bitter struggle for a country, other nations took sides. The Franco forces received aid from Germany and Italy, the government from Soviet Russia. The lineup of future opponents was taking form. But for the British, these clouds didn't appear half as dark as those nearer home. Parliament assembled, and wondering crowds watched as ministers and members came and went. Crisis, the papers said in banner headlines. For Britain had found herself faced by a constitutional dilemma unprecedented even in her long and eventful history. The nation looked to the King and to Stanley Baldwin's government. There were four and there were against. Here's an opinion from Lord Marley, Deputy Speaker of the House of Lords. The proposed marriage of King Edward and Mrs. Simpson has raised the constitutional question in Great Britain as to whether the marriage is a public or a private act. If it is a public act, the king must follow the advice of his ministers, and then the problem of abdication or following their advice uh, arises in an acute form. In my opinion, the king's marriage should be a private act and considered as such. In this case, we should be able to avoid a constitutional matter. And so the crisis dragged its length until at last, over the radio, a king made a statement telling of an issue already decided. At, at long last, I am able to say a few words of my own. I have never wanted to withhold anything, but until now, it has not been constitutionally possible for me to speak. You all know the reasons which have, have impelled me to renounce the throne. But you must believe me when I tell you that I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do without the help and support of the woman I love. And now we all have a new king. I wish him and you, his people, happiness and prosperity with all my heart. God bless you all. God save the king. Yes, it was quite a year for stamps, a time full of signs and omens and writings on the wall. Many ignored what happened in 1936 and hoped for the best, but others read, marked and made preparation. Already the converted to the new creeds were casting their gold, their rings, their honor into the melting pot of war dedicating their iron and steel and their plowshares in the name of self-expression, nationalism, Lebensraum, or just plain ambition. Already in Spain and Ethiopia, the guns were heard. First drumbeats of a tattoo that soon most of the world was to hear. At the League of Nations, the Lion of Judah climbed the dais to plead for his country. And although we didn't fully realize it then, there, but for the grace of God, went ourselves. One night in 1936, London's Crystal Palace went up in flames. No one knew how it started and no one knew how to stop it. 
But it was as though the fates were giving a warning of all they held in store by sending a monument to prosperous, complacent Victorian Britain crashing down in hellfire. That's how many remember the time of the Three Kings. The time the palace burned. Well, the pendulum stops swinging over Christmas and the New Year so that the next time to remember is half past three on January the 15th. The season of goodwill to all...